Hello and welcome to episode four of the Protection Dog Podcast. And today we're going to talk about fighting. That's right. We're going to kind of get real on what it's like to actually be in a fight. But before we get started, let's talk about our sponsors today. Fortress Canine brings you peace of mind through protection dogs. They offer personal, family, and executive protection dogs. You can contact Fortress Canine at their website, which is FortressK9.com. That's F O R T R E S S, the letter K, the number nine.com. You can also email them at Joel, J O E L, at FortressK9.com. You can text at 813 836 9244. You can contact us on Facebook at, at Fortress Canine Dogs, on Instagram at Fortress Canine, and you can search Fortress Canine on YouTube for our training videos that we post up there. All right, uh, one quick note uh, for those who are interested, and of course, if you're listening to this, um, you know, any later than the uh, April, May time frame of uh, 2020, uh, this particular note wouldn't be applicable to you, but I wanna make sure that we are announcing that we have a Dutch Shepherd litter uh, available. We still have a couple of puppies from that litter. Um, they are four weeks old now, so uh, they'll be ready to go home in another four weeks. And we also have a Malinois litter that's only about two weeks old right now. Uh, so they won't be going anywhere for about six weeks um, but we, uh, those are available for sale. If you're interested, uh, you can email me at joel at fortressk9.com. Uh, you can text me at the number that I gave you guys just a few minutes ago, 813-836-9244, or you can reach out on Facebook or Instagram. All right, now that we're done with the housekeeping portion, let's get into the topic for today and that is, let's talk about fighting. Okay, so the reason I wanted to bring this topic up is because there are a ton, a ton of misconceptions about what it's like to actually be in a fight. And that is whether we're talking about actually fighting with a dog, that is if we're talking about fighting with another human being, um, it's whether we're referring to fighting with uh, hands and feet, um, or whether we're fighting with knives, or whether we're fighting with guns. There's just this idea out there that seems to permeate. It, it probably is something that we're all affected by on a lot of different levels, but I notice it a lot in the fighting discussions, is this idea that if you just learn the right moves, you learn the right um, you know, fighting style and technique, you have the right gear, uh, you know the right information, that you're just gonna be able to win every fight. Or you're gonna be able to have a fight and not get hurt. Or whatever it is that people in their minds think because the reality of the situation is you're gonna get hurt if you get in a fight. That's just the reality of the situation. Now the level of hurt, how much you get hurt is probably where we actually get into, you know, the more you know, the better you can fight, the less you will get hurt, right? But it's just simply an, a very unrealistic approach to think that you're not gonna get hurt in a fight because like there is a small, small percentage that that might happen, right? So I'm not gonna say, oh no, every single time you get in a fight, you're, you know, you're gonna get hurt. But if you go into a fist fight with the expectation that you're gonna be able to uh, you know, punch and kick your way through it and, and not get hit, then when you get hit, you're gonna be in a really bad place. Uh, so I'll tell you a quick story. My very, very, very first fight, I think it was like eight or 10 years old, somewhere in that ballpark. And um, the kid I was fighting was about my age, but was a lot bigger, real stocky kind of kid. Uh, he was my friend, like, I don't know, probably a week before this fight, and then who knows what happens when you're kids. Suddenly, we were on, like, opposing sides of whatever it was, and, you know, we're talking about each other's mamas and insulting each other and all that kind of stuff, and, of course, threatening to fight, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he punches me in the face, right? And my head goes back, 
I come back forward. I'm still kind of trying to get my orientation again, right? And he hits me again. And yeah, I don't know, he hit me maybe four or five times and then I fell down on my butt. And that day, I determined if there's ever going to be a fight, I'm throwing the first punch, right? Now that doesn't mean that you go out and pick fights, but it does mean be realistic about what's going to happen to you if you get hit. And I've been hit and training a lot since then and it always has a disorienting effect. Right now, the, the more you get used to it, the more you're able to recover very quickly and to respond. But hitting someone in the face disorients them. Hitting someone you know, right in this neck area has a very um, neurological response from the person that gets hit there, right? So we have to be aware and not pretend that we're not going to get hit. We have to know what to do when we get hit. Right, so there's this old saying that says, if you deal with bees, you get stung. If you deal with horses, you get kicked. If you deal with dogs, you get bit. There's another saying that says, if you get in a fist fight, you get punched. If you get in a knife fight, you're gonna get cut. If you get in a gun fight, there's a pretty good chance you're gonna get shot. And if you're not willing to deal with the reality of those situations, then you're in a really bad place if a fight starts, all right? So that's kind of my intro on, uh, on why we're talking about fighting because if you're listening to this, you know we take a different approach. We try to take a very realistic approach to our training of our protection dogs and taking the, or allowing misconceptions to persist is going to set you up for failure if you ever end up in a situation where you really, really need to defend yourself. Right? So let's get into some of what these misconceptions are. And uh, at this point, if, uh, if you're going through this, you're listening to this, and you hear me miss something with the misconceptions, uh, if you're listening to this on the YouTube channel, I would love for you to comment on other misconceptions that are out there that maybe I miss. Um, or if, uh, if you disagree with something that I'm saying, I would love to hear your thoughts and comments on that as well. Uh, so that we can address that. And I definitely am not in a situation where I say I know everything and have nothing to learn. So if you have something else that you can contribute, um, we're here to bring benefit to the people who are hearing this, not just to uh, always be right, all right? So here's some of the misconceptions. We mentioned, or I mentioned just a second ago, um, you get in a fist fight, you're gonna get punched, you get in a knife fight, you're gonna get stabbed or cut, you get in a uh, gun fight, there's a chance you're gonna get shot, right? So. That, that's one, it kind of mirrors the misconception of you need to be ready to get hurt and then to deal with that anyway or to fight and win anyway, right? So when it comes to getting punched, like we said, it's disorienting. Depending on where you get hit, um, a lot of the, especially the newer type of fighting styles, the Krav Maga, um, the, uh, there's one that we train with called Naka. The, a lot of these styles are designed nowadays um, to create a neurological response, mostly pain, but it's not always pain, but to create some kind of a neurological response and to continue creating neurological responses in a way that essentially overwhelms your system. Um, and, and when that happens, the person tends to shut down or to panic. And then that places you in a position where you can either severely injure them, depending on, on how you're training, or uh, you can retreat, get away, that sort of thing. But you need to understand that that same thing can and very likely will happen to you to some degree. The, the, the objective in a fight, if you end up in a fight with your fists, which probably means you weren't very prepared to be in a fight, but if that's what happens to you, you need to be prepared to deal with that and to give more neurological stimulation, the negative neurological stimulation to the bad guy than they're giving to you, right? So the misconception being you're just gonna walk in, have a fight, and then walk away, and, and you didn't get hit or hurt, okay? If we get this question a lot with people who wanna learn how to do knife fights, and, and I'm not in big into instructing when it comes to the knife fighting stuff or any of the fighting stuff, uh, I know a little bit of it, I've done a lot of the classes, um, but I bring in guys that are either former Navy SEAL teams, um, you know, special operations types of guys to teach some of these classes for us. And one of the things um, that I try to reiterate in any of these classes that come through me 
is you have to be willing to get cut or stabbed and keep fighting and win that fight, right? Because the, the movies always present fights where somebody gets stabbed, somebody gets punched, somebody gets shot, and they just fall down on the ground and don't get back up, right? It's, it's always like the, the really, really bad guy that gets really, really hurt and still gets up and fights, but everybody else, you know, they get shot one time and they just fall down and they don't move anymore. Or, you know, they get, you know, thrown across the room because that's what really happens in a fight. You rarely, rarely can create enough force to actually throw a person about your same size around anywhere. But in the movies, that's what happens. And then they hit a wall and they fall down and they don't get back up unless it's the really, really bad guys or the good guy. And then they can get up no matter what happens to them. You know, they, they could literally have a concrete block smashed over their head and they can still get up and fight, right? So the movies create for us these highly, highly unrealistic scenarios. And then people who don't know, who've never never been in a fight or never been around a real fight, they just tend to believe that that's what happens. And here's a weird phenomenon. Um, I can't remember his name now, and that's gonna bother me. But uh, there was a guy that did a video or an audio series. Uh, he went around trying to help um, law enforcement agencies and law enforcement officers deal with stress, especially the stress of a gunfight. And so he did a series called The Bulletproof Mind. Uh, if you can get your hands on that, I would highly recommend it. Um, I don't think I have it anymore. Uh, um, now it's gonna drive me crazy to figure out what happened to it. This was years ago, but I listened to it many, many times. And he would talk about these weird phenomenons that affect people's reactions to things. And so, <clears throat> Uh, one example is when you shoot people with a handgun, handguns are terrible weapons to kill people with. That's just the bottom line. Like you may die, you know, tomorrow or next week from a handgun wound um, because of complications from a handgun wound, right? But handguns don't create this extremely high level of damage that's going to instantly end a threat. Right now, rifles, especially your high power rifles, do if you hit somebody in the right place, right? Or they may create such a, a shock, even being hit in a place that's not traumatic, um, that it will end the fight. But there's this weird phenomenon of sometimes you can shoot somebody with a 22, a long rifle, these little tiny rounds, and they'll fall on the ground. Because for whatever reason, some people have conditioned themselves to react the way people react in movies. But people who have trained themselves to deal with this or have given it any level of thought, or who are highly emotionally motivated. And this is something that's not often talked about in fights. People who are highly emotionally motivated to do something tend to take a lot of damage and not even know they're taking damage until after the fight is over, right? So if you are defending a child, for instance, you're, you're a mother or a father, and you're defending your child, there's a decent probability that you'll get this very high adrenaline dump and be able to take a lot of damage and fight through it, right? But if you've never dealt with how, how, how you deal, let's see if I can talk straight here. If you have never actually trained yourself a little bit mentally to deal with stress, there's also a really high probability you fall into one of these high stress reactions, which is things like tunnel vision, Fast, uh, fast action time or fast forward time where things are going really, really fast. You don't even know what happened. Um, slow motion time is another one. That tends to be a good thing unless you freak out when it happens, right? Because slow motion time is typically what happens when your brain goes, oh yeah, I've seen this before. We know what to do and everything slows down. It's still going normal speed in reality, but your brain is processing at a much higher level. And as long as that doesn't freak you out when it happens, which can happen, um, you tend to be able to go, oh, look, I see what they're doing, and then counter it because things have slowed down for you. So um, there's these, and those are the three biggest ones that I've seen. I've seen it both in humans and in dogs when we're teaching the dogs to fight. Um, but there, there are other ones that occur too, auditory exclusion. There are some that are visual exclusion. Um, that typically happens in low light conditions when you're already not getting to see things uh, very well. And so your, your brain kind of goes, eyes aren't working that well anyway, let's stop spending processing in energy on that and let's go all auditory and, and sense of feel, right? And so these are all stress reactions that occur. What you want to try to do is train yourself. You can do this through mental, um, 
drills where you run scenarios in your mind, uh, or you can do it through actual training. Actual training would be ideal, but not everybody can do that. So if you can't, at least try to run mental drills where you train yourself to deal with a high stress situation. What are you going to do in this situation? What are you going to do in that situation? And, and try to run a lot of variations of these drills. Okay, so what this will do is it will help you start to react in a way that's positive, that's beneficial, that makes progress for you, rather than dealing in a, in a way that you've not planned for. And so you just tend to go into panic mode, right? So. What, so let's come back to misconceptions because I tend to get off on these rabbit trails. So back to misconceptions. Misconceptions, you're going to shoot somebody and they're just going to fall down, right? You're going to stab somebody or cut somebody and they're just going to fall down. Now what they might do in reality is run away, right? Like they, you, you pull out a gun, you start shooting. They were hoping you didn't have a gun. They were hoping you would be an easy target. They go, ah, holy crap. And they run for it, right? So that that is very realistic. But what's not realistic is that you shoot them and they just fall on the ground and don't do anything. Now, if you shoot somebody in the head, in the brain, or in the spine, things like that will happen. But those are really small targets, and hitting something that's not moving is challenging for somebody who's never really shot or doesn't train a lot. If you train a lot, then your shot placement gets really a lot better. But most people only train on targets like paper targets or steel targets that are just sitting there and not moving. Shooting at a moving target is probably a hundred times more difficult than shooting at a target that's standing still, especially a moving target who's actively trying to avoid being shot, right? Who's ducking behind things and, and trying to hide as much of their body as they can so only a small portion of their body is exposing itself to to you. If, if that's what's happening, you let's say you hit you know nine out of 10, um, targets, then you're probably only going to hit nine of a hundred hits in a moving dynamic situation. So whenever I refer to dynamic, what I'm talking about is a situation that's constantly changing. It's constantly adjusting. Things are, are, you know, shifting and moving. You're having to figure it out, process and react hopefully in a good way. All right. So that's misconception. Uh, we'll, we'll kind of say that's misconception. Number one, that people get shot and fall down or that they get stabbed and they fall down or uh, misconception number two that you will get that you'll be able to fight without getting shot stabbed punched in a fight right that's a big misconception another big misconception is that you can take a lot more damage than you can because you know again we see in these movies these people are like beating each other with baseball bats across the head and they're like oh yeah that's no big deal like brush it off and keep fighting right? Almost like they're Captain America or something like that. And that just isn't the case. You get hit um, across the head or you get hit with, you know, in an arm with a bat or a pipe or something like that. You, you can continue fighting in many situations, but you're not going to be able to use a forearm, for instance, which means you're not going to be able to use your hand if someone hits you across the forearm with, with something that is a injury producing weapon. The functionality of that hand is going to be gone right or if they hit you in the in the upper leg and break your femur right then your the ability to put weight on that leg is going to be gone it doesn't mean you can't fight it just means you're going to be severely restricted and that goes both ways but again so this is what the reality of something like that is so the movies make it look like somebody gets hit and they fall down and they just lay there right the reality is Maybe you shoot somebody in the leg and they fall down, but they still have a gun or they still have a weapon. Or what a lot of people don't prep themselves for is they begin screaming in pain. Blood is spewing everywhere. And people go, holy shit, I just did that. And then they don't know what to do, right? And, and often they make really bad decisions in that panic moment because they realize I might have just killed this person, right? Depending on whether or not you can get that bleeding to stop, et cetera, et cetera. There's a bunch of different dynamic situations there. So that's another misconception is, you know, it's all clean in the movies, right? You don't walk away covered in blood splatter. And the movies that do make it like that, they they tend to like go into these other areas of, of uh, 
you know, not realistic situations, but there's a lot of screaming, there's a lot of blood, there is a lot of pain, either being given or received, in a real fight, right? Fights are not clean. So these are the misconceptions. So if I may think of some others as we go along, but I'll kind of leave it at that. I just, I think it's really important that we have a realistic perspective of what a fight is going to be like so that we have a realistic plan to deal with a fight because sugarcoating it is not going to help you when you take that first hit or you get cut for the first time or you take a shot in the arm and you don't know how to react, right? So those are the realities of a fight is people get injured, people bleed, people scream and you know make other noises of pain and you need to be prepared to continue to defend yourself because here, here's a very important underlying factor in a fight. Why are you fighting? Okay, so when people talk about fighting, a lot of times they talk about it in a very foolish way. That if they use the words that they use often when they're talking about it in a thoughtless manner, will get them put in jail if that's how they talk about it after a fight has happened, right? So there should only really be one reason you fight with somebody else, and that's because they threatened life, limb, right, or eyesight to you, that was the level of threat that they brought to you, and you fought for the sole purpose of ending the threat. That should be your only reason to fight, is to end a threat that is at the level of life, meaning they're potentially gonna kill you, limb, you're potentially gonna lose a limb, right, or eyesight. So this is typically somebody who's got like a big size advantage on you, or has a weapon that can create that kind of damage to you as a person. Right? Or maybe there's multiple attackers, because uh, multiple attackers can throw you on the ground and start kicking you and, and things of that nature, stomping on you. That will create serious, serious injury if that kind of stuff happens. So the purpose of the fight is not to fight. The purpose of the fight is not to beat the shit out of somebody. If that is your purpose, and if you word it that way, you will probably end up in prison even if you win afterwards because you said something really, really stupid. Now, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not going to give you legal advice. I do recommend you find some of these places that specifically you can become a member and, and they will step up. And if you're a member, they will defend you if you had to use um, you know, lethal force or something like that. And, and find out from them how they recommend you respond, but my response, number one, is I don't talk to police after a situation like that other than just making sure they know so that I'm not accused of not coming forward of like a hit and run type of situation. And number two, I wanna to talk to my lawyer. That's it, this is what happened. There was a fight, somebody got seriously hurt, we need help, and when they get there and they start asking questions, I want my lawyer. That's how I respond to these situations because Anything will be used against you down the road. So, all of that being said is, make sure that you're ready for the reality of a fight. Make sure that when you think through your scenarios, you use language that is useful in your defense down the road, right? Don't be stupid and foolish and prideful and be like, yeah, I'm gonna beat somebody's ass, right? Think of it from the perspective of you're standing in front of a jury explaining why this person can no longer walk or this person can no longer use their hands or this person has permanent brain injuries or this person is dead because that's what you might likely do to somebody at these levels of, of threats and these levels of fights. Why did you do that to that person? And if your answer is anything other than they were a threat to my life, then you probably shouldn't have been in that fight in the first place, right? So the why behind the fight is very important. And the why behind the fight is also gonna determine how you approach the fight. So there's a really good saying, I didn't come up with this. Um, can't remember the guy's name. I should really do better at my quotes, but uh, if I can think of it, 
Uh, I'll try and put it in the show notes. But there's a guy that says, if you don't go to stupid places and do stupid things with stupid people, you'll prevent 99% of all the bad things that could happen in your life, right? In terms of being in a threat situation, getting in a fight, needing to defend yourself. And that doesn't mean that you're not going to ever have those types of situations, but most of these situations that people find themselves in are because they went somewhere stupid with someone stupid and did something stupid, right? So let's try to think through things in advance, be smart in our decision making, be smart in where we go, how we go there, what we take with us, right? Whether you have a knife or a gun or something like that. Um, Make sure that you're making good decisions based on the before, meaning I'm not gonna set myself up for failure. The during, the if I am actually in a fight, what am I gonna do? And the after, right? So you may end up in a gunfight, but legitimately somebody uh, drew a weapon and they started shooting and you drew your weapon and you put them down to end the threat, but you were in a gun-free zone, just as an example, right? But you were like, it's my right. And I think constitutionally, you probably were right that we have the right to keep and bear arms and that shall not be infringed. And so if you're one of these people who says, I don't care what the state laws are, I don't care what any of this stuff is, I have the right to bear this arm, I'm going to bear it, then you defend somebody with it. The after is you're going to jail, right? That's that's just the reality of the situation. You're gonna go to prison for that because They're going to say you didn't have the right to have that firearm there in the first place. And most of the states that have those laws also have laws that make it an automatic 10, 20 year sentence if you violate that particular law, even if you're doing it to help somebody. So I'm not telling you to do it or not do it. I'm telling you to be very aware and very realistic in not only the before. So the the before would be you go through a checkpoint at, let's say, you know, a federal building, right? A courthouse, something like that. If you decide you're gonna try and carry a firearm through that and you get caught, that was really stupid. That's the before, right? So don't go places that you know there's gonna be a search of some kind and then get caught. Don't try to fly on airplanes with with weapons, That's or especially with firearms, right? That's really, really stupid. You're going to jail and that's the before. That's without nothing ever actually happened, right? So in those situations you go, okay, I can't take this, this, and this, what can I do? So that's your good decision making before. Then there's the during, there's the, okay, so if this person is going fisticuffs with me and he's about my same size and I have a little bit of self-defense training, I'm not gonna draw a gun and shoot him, right? Because that would be a way over stretch of what I'm allowed to do, right? What would be reasonable uh, judged by a group of my peers, right? That would be unreasonable reaction. So that's your during. When you think through your during, make sure you're not being unreasonable. And then your after is, okay, what do I do after I shoot somebody who is trying to kill other people or myself? What do I do after this dude drew a knife on me and I happened to not have my gun that day, so I drew my knife too, and now we're both all cut up, right? Maybe he ran away and I've got to figure out what am I going to do about that? Do I just let him run away? Do I call the cops and tell him? What do I do? How badly injured am I? What am I going to do, right? That's the after. And when the police show up or whoever it is, the ambulance shows up, what happens then? These are what we call in the military second, third order effects. Everything that you do has an effect down the road that is a little more broad than the immediate action that occurred at the time, okay? So think through those in your scenarios Find trainers who help you work through that. So think through those types of things as you're going through this so that when you run your mental scenarios and when you do your actual real life training, you're setting yourself up for success as best you can and not failure, right? The reality is if you end up in a real true protection, life and death situation, there are going to be consequences that there's just nothing you can do about it, right? There's gonna be an investigation. They're probably gonna take your weapon if you use a weapon in the, in the process of the situation we can't undo the processes that are essentially going to happen when that happens but we want to set ourselves up for success as best we can and a lot of things will influence that your state laws your county laws the um you know some of the federal laws that are in place all those things will have a big impact there okay so in the last few minutes uh, of our section here let's talk about dogs and humans and why a dog can be such a massive 
massive benefit to you in a situation like these that you might face, right? So number one, dogs are a huge deterrent. If somebody's looking for somebody to target individually and they see that you have a large, well-behaved dog, they're gonna go, that dog is trained. It looks like a dog that could hurt me. I'm gonna pick somebody else. So at, from a deterrent perspective, that is a massive benefit to you to have a dog with you. However, I always take the approach of if I'm going to carry a gun, it needs to be loaded, right? And what I mean by that is if I'm gonna have a gun with me and a bad guy shows up and points a gun at me and I draw my gun, or even if he doesn't draw his gun, let's say he has a knife, right? Or there's three or four of them and I draw my gun, maybe drawing my gun will scare him off. Maybe that will happen. Or maybe he goes, you're not gonna pull that trigger and he closes in, and when he does that, I better have ammo in that gun, right? It better not be a situation where I go, uh-oh, I pull the trigger and it goes click and there's nothing there. So if your dog has not been trained to fight a human being, if your dog has not been trained to engage at a level of stress with a pinnacle predator, which is what a human is, right? A person who sees you with a dog and is still willing to approach and fight is a serious threat. So. When you have a trained dog, having the ability to put that dog on what we call watch, which is where it lunges and barks and shows aggression, it's not actually biting yet, I'm holding it back with the lead, but I'm telling my dog, let that guy know that if he comes after us right now, he's going to get bit. So now I have the ability to show a level of force that's going to create a lot of damage to our bad guy if he continues to move forward, but still giving him every opportunity to leave and to get out of there and not mess with us anymore, right? So that is a huge benefit. So I can do that with a trained dog. I can put the dog on watch, tell him if you come forward, if you approach, you will be bit, do you understand? Get out of here, leave us alone, don't mess with us. Then if they move forward, now my dog will engage with that person, actually start creating injury, start biting them, start harming them. That is my next level of threat, which is bad, but anytime the person says, ah, stop, stop it, I don't wanna hurt you anymore, I can go out to my dog, and so they stop biting, and then we take control of the situation. Usually, the way that I train my clients to do it is I tell them, you know, out, plutz, turn away from me, get on the ground, if you move, you will be bit, if you try to fight again, you will be bit, do you understand, right, so now, we take control of the situation. Now maybe they, we out and they run away and I'm not gonna deploy my dog on them in reality because they're running away from us, right? And so you gotta have a really, really good justification for sending a dog after somebody if you're just a normal civilian. However, attempting to take control of the situation will put you in the dominant position in this threat situation that you just faced. And then, if the person, if you deploy your dog, they move in or they draw a weapon or something like that and you have fully it, Ratchet, and you have to actually send the dog in to fight. My intern is approaching the gate to open it for me while I'm wrapping this up so we got some dogs barking. Hey, quiet. So if you have to send that dog in, now you can decide, do I let the dog fight for me or do I join in the fight? Sometimes joining in the fight is going in and going hands on. Sometimes joining in the fight is drawing a gun and, and using it. There's all different levels, but having the dog as part of your reaction and part of what you're doing in this situation is a huge force multiplier and gives you just unlimited reactions and responses that you wouldn't have had otherwise without the dog. So this is why uh, I am such a proponent of having a dog with you. It brings you peace of mind. It gives you confidence in the situation, although don't be stupid with that confidence. And it gives you a ton of responses that you just simply cannot have any other way unless you're gonna like move around with all your bros all the time, right? Like, you know, you could replace some of these if you had a large group of people that were there with you willing to engage in a fight. But let's just be realistic, that's not what most of us uh, experience or most of us um, have at our disposal. So, if you knew, or if you know, or if you feel like you wouldn't necessarily fare the best in a real fight, whether that's a fist fight, a knife fight, a gun fight, or any other kind of realistic protection scenario and fight, then consider getting a protection dog. All right? So that wraps up our episode for today. 
I just got to the training field. You can see all the dogs are excited. So I hope this has been helpful for you. If you've enjoyed this episode, please remember to give us a five-star rating. If you haven't already, uh, if you subscribe, you'll be able to get our weekly uh, updates. And uh, we are on iTunes, Spotify, all of the uh, platforms for the various podcasts. And um, I look forward to talking to you guys next week. Train hard and stay safe.